Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Let's get after it. There is some very strange water experiments you can do with frequencies. And oh, wow. You can Look at that. It's so really the electricity cool. running into the water makes well, it do that spiral? It's sound, really. That's it's not sound. even electricity. Oh, it's sign. Sound. It's vibration. The spout is connected to a speaker. The speaker is being controlled by an Whoa. oscillation thing. But if you do all the hertz, you can see it. Oh, my God. This is incredible. This is just one experiment for this. There's a lot of other really, really cool ones. So if you change the frequency, the patterns change. This is some weird shit. So the ultrasonic waves are causing these objects to levitate. So they're le levitating in the ultrasonic waves. Is that ice? I don't even think it says exactly what they're floating there. It's probably just a piece of maybe like rice or a piece of paper or something. Holy shit. But people speculate this is maybe how uh, the pyramids might have been made because of the frequencies that people think they make or could have made. That was something Hancock that... Stuff and Eddie Griffin said outside the comic store wants high as fuck. Mm -hmm. Smoking cigarettes going. <laughs> I don't know. Pyramids how. were made with sound. Yeah. I like that theory. That's my favorite theory about the pyramids. Anyone who watches this channel regularly probably already knows this, but I'm convinced that sound is how they used, or sound frequency is what they used to build the pyramids with. And I think that video is so fascinating because it's just some guy in his backyard doing experiments with the water. It makes me want to go outside and hook the hose up and get a bunch of speakers dragged out there and start doing some experiments. Pyramids of my own. This film crew found out exactly what was going on in Antarctica and then they disappeared. This is absolutely insane and will seriously blow your mind so if you're easily scared please just keep on scrolling right now. Back in 2002, a film crew from California went to Antarctica to investigate and essentially make a documentary. Now, of course, as basically all of you do, they thought something odd was going on there, so wanted to find out a bit more. Now, this was at the time when the first satellite images of this strange pyramid-like structure appeared in Antarctica, so they wanted to check this out as well. So they got on a plane, arrived there, and started investigating. Now, on top of this, the US military claimed that they were basically doing test flights and putting people in place in Antarctica. So essentially, guys, be careful, you know, you can't go in certain places, blah 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 but when they got there of course there was no one there apparently literal military support was going down to antarctica but why now shortly after the crew arrived in antarctica and started investigating boom they vanished never to be seen again shortly after this they sent in the military and the navy seals to try and find these people and this is where it gets absolutely insane so of course they did not find the film crew anywhere no remains nothing but they discovered this derelict camp in the middle of antarctica essentially a barn and a house now this sounds like something straight out of a film but i swear to you this is real when they walked inside they found a literal tape like a cassette tape just on the table in this house and after watching this tape, even the Navy SEALs and the military swear that they were absolutely gobsmacked by what they saw. Essentially, what they found on this tape literally changed their lives. They were like, what? And this is what they said was on the tape. Now on the tape was evidence of a dig which went over two miles under the ice. Yet yeah, what? And showed almost some kind of... I'm sorry, this is crazy. Some kind of underworld. Literally, like, ancient buildings, ancient artifacts, all buried right beneath the ice in this place. Now, of course, all the military there who were looking at this were just blown out of their mind, like, don't know what to say. But again, as always, this is where it's going to get even crazier. So, of course, after the military and that left, they wanted to send this film tape into TV companies, to the government, to basically broadcast what they'd found, because it was genuinely groundbreaking. But then, the government stepped in and said, no, this is, no, this is all, there's nothing there, no one's going to be interested in seeing this, just, we, we don't need it. Then, after a long time of legal battles going to court and back, basically, these guys trying to be able to put out this tape, the government won, and they just took the tape. They were not allowed to broadcast the tape, they were not allowed to mention anything about it, so it was just gone. But now, some government officials even deny that this tape even existed and the whole thing was just completely fake, even though there was evidence of it. But what's even more crazy is that there are still lawyers right now out there working on this case, trying to get the tape back. They want to be able to get this tape out because they believe something really is going on. I think it's hilarious that this kid shows how young he is by claiming that a cassette tape is going to have video footage on it. Clearly, he just misspoke there. I found this one interesting. It's some extraordinary claims. Uh, there's no way... As of right now, I would imagine to tell if it's true or not, but I thought it was cool because uh, we talk on this channel all the time about going into Antarctica and exploring and finding out what's really been hidden from us there. So it uh, looks like somebody made an attempt to. Maybe the cassette tape will come out and show us <laughs> what they found. The Flat Earthers have another theory for you, and this time it is a theory that could explain the truth behind the Bermuda Triangle. Listen carefully and let me know if you think this could be true. It suggests that all of the theories surrounding the Bermuda Triangle are false and that there is no curse or aliens there that are pulling in all the ships and aircrafts that fly over the area. All these theories have been purposefully created as a cover-up for what actually goes on there 
and to keep people away from the area. People who believe in this theory are convinced that the Bermuda Triangle is where rockets that have failed to break the firmament land. If you're familiar with the flat earth theories, then you will know about Operation Fishbowl, a supposed effort to break through the firmament by sending nukes into the atmosphere. Now, if we look at the, the trajectory of rockets when they are sent up into the sky, it follows a curve that many believe to be the firmament. But have we ever seen them land? It is believed that all these rockets that either landed or are meant to be in space reside in the triangle and anyone who tries to go there will be stopped by the military and ordered to turn around. This is just a theory, but could they be on to something here? I feel like this one can't really be true because we haven't been shooting rockets since the start of the Bermuda Triangle. We've had ships going down there for hundreds of years. We haven't been firing off rockets for that long. Have you heard about the strange events happening along the drying Euphrates River? The Euphrates is one of the longest rivers located in the Middle East, but it is rapidly drying up. Large stretches have become nearly completely dry. Where it's drying, Explorers have discovered bizarre caves and caverns underground that were previously submerged. Strange sounds have been reported echoing from within, like screams of unknown creatures. But here's the scary thing. The Bible was written over 2,000 years ago and predicts the Euphrates drying up. Revelation chapter 9 verses 14-15 describes four angels bound within the great Euphrates River who are then released to kill a third of mankind. If this prophecy is fulfilled, with one three of the current world population being over 2.6 billion people, it would basically signal the end of the world. It's eerily coincidental that as the river dries up according to biblical prediction, mysterious caves are uncovered below where unexplained noises can be heard. The discoveries have an ominous sense of impending doom theory for humanity. One way I could see this one playing out is they open up all these caves or discover all these caves under the Euphrates and then as they go in to explore it they come into contact with some unknown pathogen or a disease that's been gone for thousands of years and <clears throat> is then reintroduced into our population and that's how we end up wiping out a third of our population you know if that prophecy is to become true that's one way it could happen it could be four different diseases under there that are collectively going to wipe us out. Mount Hermon has a very mysterious story. A story which led humanity to worship the false gods of the ancient world. You see, for thousands of years, this mountain has been a center for pagan worship. But my question is, what exactly happened there? Well, Mount Hermon is actually found in this most interesting book. It's called the Book of Enoch. See, in this book, it talks about this group of fallen angels who came down to earth. And interestingly, they would have landed on a mountain called Mount Hermon. You see, they came down to Earth for only one reason, and that was to find for themselves wives. This was obviously a highly severe crime against God. So it turns out that the very leader of the fallen angels, Semyaza, gets scared. He didn't want to take all the blame for leading his angels astray. So in response, the fallen angels bind themselves together in a mysterious oath. No angel could back out of this plan anymore. Now, fast forward to 1896, when this British explorer finds this ancient pillar on Mount Hermon. Conveniently, he finds these Greek inscriptions talking about an oath. It says, according to the great and holy God, those who take an oath proceed from here. But here's the interesting part. The God in this text is not the God of the Bible. The God in this text is actually the false God, Baal. See, there are over 30 ancient temples found in this specific area alone, which were used by the Canaanites and the Romans for pagan worship. Even the United Nations has a base here. You see, the fallen angels landed specifically on Mount Hermon, and it was there where they would become the false gods of the ancient world. So, my copy of the Book of Enoch is still on its way from Amazon. If anyone has read it, could let me know down in the uh, comment section. Does it go into detail about the name of the mountain that the angels descend on, and is what this guy's saying accurate? I love watching stuff like this, but it's really hard for me to know if the guy's got a, a skewed interpretation of what he's reading or what, because I haven't been able to read it myself. So if anyone could let me know down in the comments, I would appreciate that. In 1994, a man named Robert Baval leased his book 
book called The Orion Mystery, where he outlined his theory that the three pyramids of the Giza Plateau may actually have a deeply rooted connection to the Orion constellation, more specifically, the three stars that make up Orion's belt. He points to the fact that when viewed from above, the size of the three pyramids, along with their positions relative to each other, are an exact mirror image of Orion's belt. Additionally, when you look out of the southern shaft of the King's Chamber on the equinox, the shaft points directly towards the belt of Orion. But not in present day, this only occurs if you wind back the skies exactly 4,500 years right around the time when the Great Pyramid was built. Ironically, this same phenomenon is found across the globe in the pyramids of Teotihuacan, Mexico, where the layout of these Mayan pyramids from an aerial view closely resembles both Orion's belt and the Great Pyramids of Giza. And when you take all of this into consideration, along with the unanswered questions regarding how the pyramids were built, you have to ask yourself, if the Great Pyramid of Giza wasn't a tomb, then what the heck was it? Because whoever built both of these sites across the globe in ancient times clearly were influenced by the same information. One insight into this question may lie in the research of an electronics engineer and inventor, Joe Parr, who started studying the electrical, magnetic, and radioactive properties of the Great Pyramid from 1977 to 1987. Joe believed that given the shape of the pyramid and the inherent electromagnetic properties of the limestone and quartz that it was made of, the pyramid itself might have a detectable energy field around it. The only problem is that if one existed, it likely wasn't strong enough today to have any inherent function. That's why one day he built a smaller scale model of the pyramid in order to do an experiment where he would send an alternating magnetic current through it to try to strengthen this field. And when he did, something very interesting happened. The pyramid started to form an energy bubble around it that was essentially a force field blocking out any external forms of radiation, including gamma rays. Intrigued, Parr then decided to take the experiment one step further, this time by placing a centrifuge inside the center of it and spinning it at a very high rate to try to amplify the strength of this bubble. And when he did, once the bubble fully formed, the pyramid started to become weightless and levitate. Now here's where the experiment took a mind-bending turn. The orb of energy eventually became so strong that while levitating, the pyramid itself seemed to phase shift out of sight altogether before then reappearing embedded into the walls of the room where this experiment was happening. A result that led Parr to believe that given the right conditions, structures with a pyramid shape had the ability to enter what he called hyperspace, allowing it to pass through physical objects. And over the course of these experiments, Parr also made note of the fact that the time time of year specifically seemed to have a direct effect on the strength of the bubble that was formed, being strongest around mid-December, or more specifically, December 12th through 16th. Something he found had to do with the natural flow of charged particles coming out of the sun that the Earth would naturally pass through as it orbited around the sun. Ironically, it's exactly during those dates that the Earth, the sun, and Orion's belt form a perfectly straight line, a finding that Parr documented in his research at least seven years before Robert Bavall's book The Orion Mystery ever came out. I thought that one was interesting. It's interesting, but at the same time, it sounds like hocus pocus. It sounds like uh, science fiction. This experiment that this guy did. I mean, if he wrote it down in a book, I'm sure he did research papers on it and stuff. I'm sure that you're able to get out there and read those papers and, and look that stuff up and see what his findings were. I do feel like if this were a thing, though, there would be a lot of money being poured into researching this, and we would hear a lot more about it instead of just one random one-off experiment that happened years and years ago. Though whenever it comes to this phase shift stuff, um, that's exactly the type of stuff that you hear stories of the government messing with that they're hiding from us. So in that sense, it would make sense that we don't hear anything about it. So there's this physicist, Miguel Acuberi. He conceived the calculations for a theoretical ship that could travel faster than the speed of light. All that a right. human being gets inside of? Yes. He's apparently figured out the equations to make it successful. Okay. This is where it gets trippy. Physics say you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but this ship, it stays still and the universe travels past it. How does that make sense? It creates its own space-time bubble, like a gravitational wave-making machine that compresses the ocean of space-time in front of it and expands that ocean in its weight. What? They said that you can travel six trillion miles in the blink of an eye. Because the cosmos, the universe, galaxies are moving that fast. Are we sure he did any math on this or he just used his imagination and said... Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about. It has to be mm -hmm. somewhat legit. Like just some sixth grader just with like a funny idea. Get this. We create our own space bubble <laughs> and then the universe moves around our space bubble. Wait, 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 wait. Six trillion miles in a second. Wait a second. What's gassing it though? Public complete sun. So towards the end of this video, we're actually going to hear Neil deGrasse Tyson speak on this. I just wanted to throw that in there. This was the first that I'd heard of it was from that podcast. Hearing it at first, I thought, 
oh, this is bull crap. As much as I don't like the guy, if Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks it's true, um, I don't see him as the type of person who is going to risk what's clearly important to him, his reputation, in order to help promote some pseudoscience. Uh, if he thinks that it's pseudoscience, I don't see him out there promoting it. So I thought it was interesting specifically for that aspect. <laughs> Photographs all appear to have been taken on a professionally lit soundstage, which could have easily been part of their billion dollar simulation project. And when you compare scenes from the Apollo moon landing footage with scenes from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, there is strong evidence that the exact same technology was used. In the late 60s, a state of the art front projection system developed by Scotchlight allowed Kubrick to simulate expansive backgrounds by projecting them onto a large screen made with small glass beads. The giveaway for this cinematic trickery is that the foreground must always hide the bottom of the Scotchlight projection screen in the background. In order to do this, the bottom of each set needs to have a complete horizon line between the set in the foreground and the screen in the background. And we can see this signature in all the Apollo images. We can also see light refraction off the glass beads in the Scotch light screen. The lunar module appears to be cheaply constructed with tin foil and Scotch tape. And the 10,000 pound thrust rocket on this flimsy craft didn't even leave a mark in the ground beneath it. There is no moisture or discernible atmosphere on the moon. And yet we can see mud and dust being flung into the air. Again, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. Uh, that's not what my channel is all about. I, I don't care what other people believe. I'm just here because I like these videos. I think they're fun and I like sharing them with people and discussing things in the comments. That being said, everything that I watch about the moon landing just reaffirms to me that it never happened. That lander that they're in that supposedly has this 10,000 pound thruster on it looks like it would blow away from the pressure of liftoff. <laughs> it does like... <laughs> like blow apart it just looks like it would disintegrate just from the pressure of trying to take off how anyone can look at that and walk away thinking that we actually went to the moon i feel like is a stretch but to each their own hey if you're enjoying this video i make a new one just like it every single day it would be awesome if you'd hit that subscribe button and come back tomorrow to join me in the documentary film a funny thing happened on the way to the moon the three astronauts of apollo 11 are seen in low earth orbit figuring out how to stage a fake image for the camera. This film was recorded when the Apollo 11 was said to be nearing lunar orbit, and we can see and hear them manipulating the shot to make the Earth appear to be thousands of miles away, when in fact they have blacked out the inside of the craft and are blocking off the window facing the surface to make it look like the Earth at a distance. When we hear Houston radio approval for the shot, the astronauts do not respond until an unknown third party can be heard whispering, talk. Call Apollo 11, Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks so great, over. The astronauts are told they are being pre-recorded and edited for a subsequent live broadcast. Buzz Aldrin explains how they shut out the sun to achieve the illusion of the one window being the Earth in the black of space. And with direction from Houston, they get it to look right for the camera. We then hear the portion meant for the public, with Neil Armstrong claiming to be 130,000 miles from Earth and describing a single camera pressed up against the window to achieve the shot. But in the unedited footage, we see objects passing between the camera and the window. We see a work light in the dark. And finally, when they are done with their hoax, the final few frames reveal the truth. Protecting humans in this radiation wasn't the only problem. <laughs> that one is a little harder for me to follow exactly what they're claiming is happening. Uh, I know 
it's obvious there's something screwy going on with the way that they're trying to get that shot and that they're not being completely honest with us on how they're filming it. Not as convincing as the loon, as the actual footage of the moon landing being fake. Not, not to me, it, at least, but um, still interesting. Standing in the spotlight. The high-end Hasselblad camera had no protection against radiation, and there is no explanation as to how it was able to take photographs in negative 200-degree weather with a constant bombardment of cosmic radiation. And the pictures themselves are full of anomalies. According to the official story, the only external light source was the sun. But in all these photographs, there appears to be only artificial light, hot spots, and fall-off areas, when it should be as bright as a desert on Earth. And if the sun were the only light source, then all shadows would run parallel to each other. But in these photos, shadows either run perpendicular to each other, proving multiple light sources, or in others, the shadows are divergent, proving a single local light source. Shadows created by sunlight have a sharp edge. Shadows created by artificial light have fuzzy edges. Even the camera expert from Hasselblad agrees that these photos were shot using artificial light sources. Yes, it, it seems like he's standing in the spotlight. <laughs> and I can't explain that. Um, that, that escapes me. <laughs> Why? And yet more evidence that all of that was fake. Now, does this prove that we've never landed on the moon? No. Does it prove that... Does it prove anything? No. But the evidence that we did land on the moon, as far as the evidence they're giving us, points in exactly the opposite direction. And no one can convince me otherwise. I'm not going to say that we never landed on the moon. I'll just say that the video footage that they're showing us is all make-believe. If we did land on the moon, we just haven't seen the real footage of it because they're hiding something from it. Think about this. This video here is uh, allegedly because of CERN opening up a portal. Now the thing is, I do know that the capability that CERN has does do exactly this type of event here. But uh, I'm going to just play this, let you guys look at this and see what you think. Ooh. This was CERN being powered up and a vortex being opened as a result. I don't know how long this video would stay out there public if it really is authentic. Uh, but this is over Geneva, Switzerland. Only imagine you go to play. Seen there. that? You seen that come out of the clouds? Man, what was that? I'm not convinced this is real. The first of all, it says Israel News Live. It's uh, it tells you to contact them at a PO box in Sunbright, Tennessee, in the United States. They're playing a YouTube video. Clearly, they're just streaming it right off of YouTube. You can see them push play in real time. And the video footage looks like the same thing that you see on uh, any Marvel movie when they open up a portal or something. It, it just looks identical. It looks like CGI. It doesn't look doesn't look real but it's but that being said if they were to rip a, a hole in the space-time continuum right over the top of uh, the large hadron collider it wouldn't surprise me at all i would only be surprised that we had video footage of it and that we were aware it's going on there is a computer that can now make the simulation theory reality the university of western sydney in australia has created a human-like computer called deep south deep south is all set to roll out in april 2024 it uses what they call neuromorphic engineering which is a technical way of saying it copies how our brains work. Our brains can do a lot of things at once, and Deep South can do the same. It's like having a bunch of little brain cells that talk to each other extremely fast. One interesting aspect about Deep South is that it doesn't consume a lot of power. Our brains are extremely efficient, using only 20 watts of power to do trillions of operations per second, and neuromorphic computers use about 10% of the energy of conventional computers which is also extremely energy efficient, so it's quick and compact. Imagine being able to put this type of technology into a humanoid robot and giving it AI capabilities. The reality of having a true human-like assistant is right around the corner. With the ability to create brain-level simulations, it may allow for the creation of a simulation so realistic that it can trick the brain into believing the simulation is real. Are you excited for Deep South? Would you get a human-thinking robot assistant 
let us know in the comments. I think I would get a human robot assistant if it was uh, much slower than me, both physically and mentally. I don't want something that can outperform me and outthink me. I want something that is there to assist, something that can come partially up to my level of capabilities. I don't want something that can overpower me uh, physically or mentally. You know, that just seems like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> it seems like at that point, if you've bought one of those things that it's you know, physically stronger and faster than you, mentally fa uh, faster and stronger than you. If you're buying that and bring it in your home, I don't think you should even be able to, to sue Tesla whenever that thing overpowers you and decides to uh, kick you out and replace you as the head of the household. <laughs> At my age, which is now 73, um, I can't avoid being aware that my time on this planet is limited. Um, my work, my studies, my experiences over the years have left me with absolutely no fear of death. I do regard it as the beginning of the next great adventure. What do you think that is? When you say the next great where where are you getting this belief from and what, what do you think it is? It goes back to a near-death experience I had in my late teens, massive electric shock. I left my body, was up around the light, saw myself slumped on the floor, and then I came back into my body. But from that moment, I doubted whether I am just my body or whether there's more to me than, mm. than that, more to all of us than that. Ancient Egyptian ideas uh, about this realm being a theater of experience where we come to learn and to grow and de develop, we, we, we're obliged constantly, every day, to make choices, and those choices define us. Yesterday, after I made the comment of the about the whole uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed thing, and so will always be here, uh, someone messaged me asking me to go into more detail about my thoughts on that and that's why I put this video in here because um, I feel like it it's it relates in a sense if we know the energy cannot be created and cannot be destroyed then you've always been here and you will always be here in some form that's why whenever I say I'm not worried about dying or what happens next it's just uh you know are you here right now yes is everything all right yeah so all of the time that predates your existence in this reality you were okay and everything worked out fine for you to get to this point so everything will continue to work out fine and be okay after this point and so that's kind of my mentality or that's kind of my mindset whenever i think about death is um it's just the next adventure it's just the next thing that's going to happen i don't know what it is but i didn't know what this life was before i started it either and i'm enjoying the hell out of it so no reason to believe that the next one will be any different is it possible to build a ship that could break the cosmic speed limit a mathematical physicist, Miguel Alcubierre of Mexico, inspired by the original Star Trek television series, conceived the calculations for a ship that could theoretically travel faster than the speed of light. If successful, it could cut the travel time between our sun and this distant star system down to a single year, or even less. But wait a minute, isn't it a cardinal rule of science that thou shalt not travel faster than light? It is. But here's the thing about the Alcubierre Drive. It doesn't move. Cosmos does. The ship itself would be enclosed in its own space-time bubble, where it needn't violate any laws of physics. Harold White of the United States ironed out some of the kinks, such as prohibitively enormous energy requirements to fly it. But it remains far beyond our immediate grasp. The Alcubierre drive ship is a gravitational wave-making machine that compresses the ocean of space-time in front of it and expands that ocean in its wake. Jet skis for joyriding through the galaxy and beyond. An advanced version of our Alcubierre drive could do 600 trillion miles in the blink of an eye. So again, if that guy's claiming that there's some truth to this uh, theory of this ship, then I believe it because I don't think that he would risk his reputation to talk about it if he didn't think that it was true. I think that's absolutely fascinating. I actually did a little research on this, and if what I read is true, then Elon Musk is actually in talks with this guy uh, about potentially developing out this technology in the future, about taking some of the first steps to get there. From what I read, they don't think that it'll happen in our lifetime, but that the research could be done now for the to give them the the building blocks in the future so very very fascinating 
Well, guys, that's the end of this video. I'm going to call it quits here. I hope you enjoyed the clips that I put together for you today. I enjoyed sharing them with you, and I will be back here for the next one tomorrow. If you all have an amazingly safe and wonderful day, I will see you tomorrow.